it's been a blockbuster earnings reaction for you, but also a pivotal moment in Morgan Stanley's history with you announcing that you would step down into next year sometime. How did you know that this was the right time for you? Well, th firstly, Shanali, thanks for coming over. Um, 14 years is a, it's a long time to do anything and to run a global bank um, and deal with all the changes that are going on in the world. Uh, you know, it's, it's important for organizations to refresh. So I think it's certainly a very long time to be a bank CEO and everybody's got to find their own agenda. My focus is on ensuring that this place does well over the next 10 and 20 years to do that you need to give the next generation a chance. And they will do things differently and they will grow the place in a way that I might, have, might not have imagined. So it's, it's exciting, it feels right. What criteria is the board using to choose a new CEO? I mean, it's a big open question on who might take over next. You've said there are three candidates. How do we think about who the next person is? Well, I think you've got, you look at a whole range of uh, criteria. The, the first and obvious one is that they're good at running businesses. And, and uh, you know, when I took over the job, I was actually running the smallest and worst performing part of the company, but we were turning it around. So the board wants to know they're good business leaders. But the other are, are qualities which, which every institution, be it educational, uh, government, or, or uh, not-for-profit, or, or public companies look for in leaders. It's, it's character, it's endurance, resilience. Uh, strategic sense, communication skills, all the obvious stuff that you'd expect. And fortunately, we've got three fabulous candidates. Uh, they're all internal and they all have uh, great business skills. And now the board has, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to figure out who's the best to lead Morgan Stanley for the years ahead. Uh, the Morgan Stanley that we're going to become. So I think they can all do it. If you think about just how much Morgan Stanley has changed and the investments you've made in wealth management, investment management, and frankly, the idea here that the profitability of the wealth manager is just through the roof and frankly, a lot more than you're seeing even in institutional securities, does it make more sense for the future leader to come from some of those growth areas? Well, I'm not going to get into speculating, which is, uh, uh, you know, what I'm sure you'd like me to do. But the board doesn't look so much at how a specific business is performing. They look at, again, the enduring qualities of the leader and whether they have the kinds of skills you need to lead a complex global institution. And as I said, all three of the people we have internally are terrifically well equipped. They're great people. Uh, they have great respect for each other. They have terrific values. So, you know, we're, we've got, it's an embarrassment of riches is all I'll say. How do you focus on <clears throat> culture during this transition? How do you ensure that whoever doesn't get the job stays on board? Is that something you worry about? Mm, not really. No, I think, you know, we've, we've worked together for, I think, with this team, plus the other senior leadership, people like Sharon Yashai, our CFO is on the call, uh, Eric Grossman, our chief legal officer, uh, Carol Vincent Green, who, who runs internal audit. We, we've had a uh, very significant leadership team working closely together for a long period of time. What matters about culture is you share the same values, and we share the same values. There's no, there won't be the drama that uh, people perhaps look for in succession around this particular one, I'm convinced. I think it will be relatively seamless and I think it will lead to a great outcome. Now we have to talk about the numbers here because wealth management. Sure. $200 billion in net new money for the first half of the year. And it's quite breathtaking. It's certainly nothing to cry about here. How much of this is a function of the dislocations in the market, the business that you've taken on from First Republic or Silicon Valley Bank? Uh, I would think, um, I don't know exactly, but my guess is less than 10% related to that. So 90% related to just the change in the business model that we've put in place over the last, you know, 15 years. And, and uh, that business now led by Andy Saperstein have figured out a variety of ways to grow client activity, whether it's through direct, through the E-Trade platform, and the digital bank, whether it's through the workplace, which we did first with Solium, the acquisition, then the E-Trade workplace, uh, the advisor-led channel, we've had very low turnover of advisors, and we still seem to be the place of choice for many of our competitors, uh, financial advisors. So it's, it, the, the beauty of it is it's no one single thing. This quarter, it was a bit more advisor-driven than it was last quarter, but all of them are contributing. That's why I think it's going to endure. When you look at the stock price, on my way over here, it was up more than 7%. You're on track to have the best performance in trading right after an earnings release in your, in, in your tenure, certainly, if not history here. So what do you think investors are latching onto when they look at today's numbers? 
I think I should retire right today, isn't, <laughs> isn't this the moment where you drop the mic or something? Um, well, then who's the new CEO? Yeah, I know. Well, that's not going to happen. Uh, nice try, though. Um, no, listen, we had, we had some big movements in the stock when it was very low back in 12 and 14 and 16, 2012, 14, 16. Uh, no, but today's big, but it's, it's just reflective of the fundamentals are really strong. Our capital ratios, I mean, we'll see when all the banks report. We're close to the end of the major banks. But I'm pretty sure we've got the highest capital levels of any bank, any major bank in the US. Uh, the net new money numbers you reference are obviously evidence of growth. And our dividend is 4% or close to it. So a combination of really high conservative capital levels, obvious organic growth within a couple of core businesses, and very high dividend yield for what we do, I think the investors sensibly <clears throat> look past um, what's been going on in the market recently. You know, IPO activity is obviously down, M&A activity is down, uh, some of the fixed income trading was a little more muted. N none of that matters, right? It, it, strategically, that doesn't matter. That's a point in time market sentiment. That will change. Deals will get done. Companies will go public. People will trade. So I think the market sensibly looked at the big picture items and said, yeah, the rest of the stuff will just come. And that's why we're trading the way we're trading. It was a great clean quarter. When you look at investment banking, trading, mm. advisory, yeah. when do they come back and how robust will that activity be? Well, I think I don't know when exactly. Uh, I do believe it's bottomed. And we were just talking before we got on air, you know, I've been to in the last couple of months, Australia, Japan, Saudi, France, England, Amsterdam, I mean, I, and all over the US. And every CEO I'm talking to has tilted to a more forward looking posture. Um, so I think deal, deals will start getting done. Whether they happen in the back half of this year, I'm not so sure. It might be it might be next year that it comes, but it'll definitely be it will be during next year when we see it, if not this year. James, what does all of this mean for headcount? You've booked a more than three hundred million dollar cost tied to severance packages, but it seems like headcount is starting to stabilize. Do you think that a rebound in some of this activity means that you could bring more people on, or do you still see more cuts in certain not, areas? Not really. I mean, we we laid off about eighteen hundred people last December, and we knew that was an optimistic view. Um, and I said to the team, if by April things haven't turned, we'll have to unfortunately do it again. And we ended up laying off another 3,500 people. Now, against that backdrop, we've had attrition, I think, is running almost 50% what historical rates are. We've got 83,000 employees. We bought two huge companies, E-Trade and e Advance, and we guaranteed everybody their job during COVID. So headcount was, if you will, artificially high. I regarded this as bringing us back to what the normal run rate should be. I don't think we're going to add to that. I mean, one of the beauties of this business, it's very scale driven. If you do a few more trades, you don't need more people to do it for the same clients. So, no, I think we're about right with headcount right now. But obviously, you know, we're, we, we're, we've got fiduciary responsibility, share, shareholders deliver returns, and we watch that carefully. You know, your views sound fairly mm. rosy. I mean, it sounds like you are pretty sanguine about the direction of travel here across different business lines. Earlier this week, Secretary of Treasury uh, Yellen had told us that she believes that there might not be a recession. Do you agree with that view? Well, I've, I've said publicly for over a year, I thought the probability of recession was low. And if we have one, the magnitude uh, is likely to be relatively modest. So I've been sort of between probability low. So likely we don't have a recession. And if we do, it's not going to matter that much. And I think things are playing out that way. I mean, uh, Chairman Powell said it. You know, it is possible to have soft landings, right? It's been done, I think, six of the last 11 rate increase periods. I believe I'm right in saying that. There have been soft landings. So it's not a given you have a recession. With unemployment uh, where it is, inflation now coming down under 4%, unemployment still under 4%, decent economic growth, stable markets, uh, the banking system, balance sheets are strong, and consumer balance sheets are OK. Uh, that's a pretty good backdrop. Now, some industry sectors obviously hurting more than others. but. You're seeing it in the earnings this quarter. The earnings are not really bad. They're not great, but they're not disappointing. So then what keeps you up at night? To the extent that anything can derail kind of this progress in the economy, what would it be? I mean, the, the, the real macro issue, if you step back from it, is the China-US relationship. Um, the GDP of those two countries, I think, is 40% of the global GDP. 
Uh, they're very dependent. We're very dependent on China. China is more dependent on the rest of the world, frankly, for trade. So that's that's the that's sort of the tipping point. I mean, there's an existential one, which is the U.S. defaulting on its debt. That didn't happen. It's insane that we should even be having these discussions. But thankfully, they got through the charade again. But what really matters is U.S.-China geopolitical relationships for global trade and economic expansion. And within that, you know, you've seen Secretary Blinken and now Secretary Yellen in the last month both going there. We're getting to a more constructive tone. So, you know, but, Shanelli, honestly, after all the years of doing this, I don't worry a lot at night. I mean, stuff happens and you deal with it. You have a strategy which is designed to carry the, the company forward for a decade or more. And you accept the inevitable disappointments along the way or the things that go wrong. And that's just part of being in leadership job. Speaking of the next 10 years, there is something around the corner that has the potential to impact some of the biggest businesses you have, and that is that Basel III mm. endgame. Sure. New regulations in the United States and across the globe that are targeting now fee-based businesses, which has become a big part of your business, as well as trading businesses. How do you expect those rules to eventually impact the returns on those businesses? Yeah. Well, firstly, and I'll try not to get too weedy, but the, the, the rule hasn't been proposed yet. Um, we've, we've had Basel 1, Basel 2, Basel 3, as I joke, finally we're at the end because they're now calling it Basel 3 Endgame. Uh, so I guess we're not going to get 4 and 5. Europe has not even caught up and complied with its own Basel rules. Um, the US has had a system parallel to Basel called SICA, and all of the banks have come through SICA this cycle very well. So. Based upon Vice Chair uh, Barr's speech, clearly they're going ahead with a holistic, so they look at Sikar and Basel review. That will be proposed in a couple of weeks. I expect it to be uh, pretty challenging for the banking system at first blush. But if you read the speech by the Vice Chair and various other commentary, it is clear that they want input and they're going to need input. There are things that were proposed under the European system that I just don't think are appropriate for the US system, like, as you said, changing the way they measure operating risk, RWAs, risk-weighted assets, based on the fee businesses you have. That's completely intellectually counterintuitive to what you want in fee-based businesses, which is stability. So I, I don't see why the US financial system should be dictated by the European uh, regulators. And uh, I just don't see that's where it's going to end up. I think there'll be, there'll be a lot of discussion. And my guess is none of this gets implemented before the end of 2026. So several years to adjust. And we carry currently a, a 260 basis point capital buffer. Our CT1 ratio this quarter was 15.5%. Our requirement under CCAO was 12.9%. So we are very conservatively positioned in anticipation whatever changes may happen. But again, Shanali, the key is they're going to happen over years. This isn't going to be tomorrow. But the changes that would happen would still be <laughs> under a new regime at Morgan Stanley, would be under a new executive. Do you think that I hope so. the bank <laughs> will have to make changes around its business lines if these rules were to be as stringent as they seem No, I don't think be? so. No, no. We, it won't change our strategy. I mean, we'd, we'd make adjustments on RWAs and parts of the business. But no, it's, it's manageable. It's just I'm separating is it manageable from is it the right thing to do? And I don't think the U US economy is what matters here. And for the US economy to thrive, we need a strong banking system led by the largest banks in the country. And we should determine what is the right capital structure for our banks, not have it determined by some other body outside of this country in the national interest. There's we should do it. That old saying that if you squeeze Wall Street like a sponge, the activity will move mm -hmm. elsewhere. And a lot of your rivals have said that they're very concerned about the activity moving outside of the banking system into the non-banks. Do you share that concern? And what are the risks that are emerging that are maybe going unnoticed? Well, there's always, um, you know, if, if, you, if you pressure the regulatory part of the industry, it will move to the non-regulated part because they don't have the same capital charges that, that we have. So, yes, that, that is a real risk. And in fact, and again, not to get too weedy, but something called the supplemental leverage ratio, which simply takes uh, the amount of capital you have and the size of your balance sheet, basically hurts you for carrying a large balance sheet, even if it's all treasuries. And you participate in the treasuries market to provide liquidity to the broader financial system. So, yes, there are consequences from decisions. And that's why 
the regulators sensibly have asked for and will ask for a very long comment period. And they'll get vigorous comment from me and from others. I'm quite firm on this. We, do, we don't need a complete redo of the capital system here. And we'll make the case as to why that's so. James, what about you? What does life <coughs> after Morgan Stanley look for you? Do you think you'll stay in financial services or consider a career somewhere else, <coughs> perhaps politics? No, I'm very happy uh, with my life. It's, you know, my, my focus is on uh, handing it over to my successor and uh, making sure they have the, what I described as the cleanest plate possible. So as many of the, we have a few remaining issues that I want to work through and get those cleaned up. And, and probably based on my experience, I can handle some of this stuff more easily than somebody starting day one. And after that, I don't know. I'm Australian. Uh, I'll spend a little more time with my family there. I'll obviously keep working in some capacity. And I'll, I'll teach a little bit. And you know, who, who knows? The, the beauty of life is there are, a lot, there are a lot of things to do. So I'm, I'm embracing that and enthusiastic about it.